How did your career in gems begin? I've got a long story. We've gotten so many questions from you all, not only about you know gemstones, but also like how we got into the business. So we basically told our story to the team and then they kind of picked specimens or props that are gonna help us tell the story. Okay, ooh, I know exactly what all this is. As you all know, I am a Nebraska girl born and bred. I'm very proud of that. That's also where I got my start in the jewelry business. In Nebraska, there is a jewelry store called Borsheim's. Borsheim's is owned by Berkshire Hathaway, which is Warren Buffett's company. And Borsheim's is actually where I started working. My first job there was when I was a sophomore in college. I was in customer service. I was cleaning dirty engagement rings with a toothbrush. And let me tell you, I absolutely loved it. So that's kind of what this box is. We have marcasite right here. Marcasite is often found in Nebraska. But the best part about Borsheim's was they just had like, breathtaking jewelry. We have kind of an antique looking piece. We have some high end looking pieces. And you know, this looks like the kind of stuff I would have seen or I would have been working with. My mentor, my boss at the time, she said, you know, you should really think about the jewelry industry as a career. It's a great career for a woman. There's a lot of opportunity. So I applied to GIA in the first semester of my senior year. I got in. Literally, I was in the library at my university. And when I found out, I like jumped and one of my girlfriends and I were like cheering. It was like so exciting. Just like the best way to end the semester. Okay, tell us about your education. All right, this box is emerald and tourmaline. Tourmaline signifies California. So I graduated college and then I moved to California and I completed my graduate gemologist degree on campus at GIA at the headquarters in Carlsbad, California. It is a gorgeous location. So I had this like, really wonderful opportunity. I had really great memories. I made some really great friends. I remember we went to a gemstone mine. It was a tourmaline mine. The craziest thing about that day was the gentleman that we were with at the end of the day, he said, all right, everyone turn off your flashlights and everything. Cause he wanted us to see like what it was like, how dark it was. So all of us turned off the flashlights and I remember putting my hand in front of my face and like I couldn't see my hand and I had never been somewhere where it was that dark. So there's one day at GIA, I am flipping through my emails and I see this email about an internship in Brazil. I remember like jumping out of my seat, putting the application in and I ended up getting that internship. So in the span of like three weeks, I passed my 20 stone test on the first try, thank God. I packed up my California apartment. I flew back to Nebraska with all my stuff. And then I like repacked everything and then I flew down to Brazil. So I land in the Rio de Janeiro airport and I find out that my luggage is still in Atlanta. I have one backpack and I'm wearing a wool blazer and like a long sleeve shirt because I left Nebraska in like end of March and it was freezing. So then from Rio de Janeiro, I fly to Belo Horizonte where I was meeting a colleague and then we had like a 10 hour drive ahead of us. I'm driving through Brazil and it's like two lane roads, everyone's speeding and then all of a sudden we hit this traffic and we realized that this traffic is a truck full of bananas. I had crashed or like tipped over. So there is literally like banana, banana peels, banana guts, like all over the road, everyone is stopped and is like picking up these bananas. So I like go and pick up a couple and I, I think I like held them like this, like close to me. Well, I didn't realize that bananas A have sap and B banana sap stains. Again, I had no luggage, I had nothing. And the one shirt I had that was appropriate in like business attire, not like a t-shirt was covered in banana sap. So yeah, it was just like this crazy experience. I literally lived with lizards, sloths were my neighbors. I saw stones every day. I saw a lot of emeralds. I, I wish you could see the imagery I have in my head because it, it was just the most wonderful experience ever. Okay, what was the toughest thing to learn? So when you're at GIA, it's a lot of like learning how to identify stones. But when you're in Brazil, it was a lot of how to grade stones. I would get sets like these. I would like literally have to memorize like what's the price for something like this versus something like this. These are basically like grading sets or like master sets. This is what I was doing every single day. It was gem business 101 and I learned it from the source, mind to market. 
I got to JTV through Brazil. Jay Boyle, who you guys have seen before, he's fantastic. So he would like call us looking for stones for JTV that we would go and look for. And then Jay said very nice things about JTV and that inspired me to apply for a job here and that's how I got to JTV. This pencil signifies one of my best memories at JTV and that was when Jay Boyle and I went to New York City. There was a big gemstone jewelry show. It was my first time in New York City and it was all this like old estate jewelry. I tried on a necklace that was allegedly worn by Miss Italy in the 50s. It was this like coral and diamond necklace. It was just like this incredible jewelry. When I was there, I just like bought this like little pencil and I've never used it for like four or five years. But this pencil, it's like one of my best memories at JTV. Just being able to walk around 47th Street in the Diamond District and like seeing all the stones, it was just mind blowing. What advice do you have to future gemologists? Oh, I know what this is. Okay, so I have this friend in the jewelry business and she gave me some advice right before I went to Brazil. She said, when the cookie tray comes around, take the cookie, because you don't know when it's gonna come back. And that's kind of always been my motto when there's been opportunities in the jewelry business, whether it's me getting on YouTube or flying to Brazil or going to New York City or any other myriad of things I've said yes to, you gotta take the cookie because they taste good and you never know what's gonna happen. How did your love of rocks begin? Woohoo! So, <laughs> when I was a little kid, I'm sure most people have met a little kid like the way that I was. Everywhere they go, they pick up some random rock. My family took a lot of really awesome vacations out west. These are all rocks from Montana. You can't really tell the colors now. They've actually been in a fish tank for the last 12 years. We were on a family vacation. My parents decided we we're gonna have a picnic at this lake. The whole bottom of the lake was basically reds and blues and greens. And so me being my little determined self decided I was gonna go in this lake and I was gonna go swimming and I was gonna get those rocks because I actually thought they were turquoise. <laughs> These used to be much more vibrant blue-green. At least I remember them being a lot prettier. But I went and jumped in this lake and let me tell you, Oh my gosh, it was cold. I actually ended up throwing my clothes and I think my towel onto a bush and they got covered in fire ants. And so I ended up like putting a towel on me that had fire ants on it and it was this whole ordeal. <laughs> That's kind of my first little love story with rocks. And it's funny because it actually took me going to college to realize that there's actually a career for people that love rocks. So moving on to college, I started off as an engineer, decided I hated it. Actually decided I hated math but I was riding on the University of Tennessee equestrian team and one of the girls was a geologist. She goes, hey, why don't you go talk to my professor and see if you want to just try geology? I ended up taking, I think it was either three or four geology classes in one semester. And I basically said, either I'm gonna love it or I'm gonna absolutely hate it by the end of the semester. And I ended up loving it. Second semester in geology, they told us about a extra credit opportunity. It was to volunteer with the Knoxville Gem and Mineral Show. I really loved it. I had no idea that all these crystals came in such interesting shapes and colors. And I decided I was gonna pick up my first mineral specimen. I didn't have a lot of money. I found a guy selling green fluorite. And I thought these were really interesting and really pretty and they were just in my price range. <laughs> and I had him bring out every flat of these cheap fluorite specimens that he had. And I looked through all of them for probably an hour. I eventually settled on this one. It was because I really loved that it had all these really cool little growth zones in some of the crystals. And it was a whole $18. And I think I ate ramen <laughs> for a few meals after that. This is what's representative of my senior thesis. So I actually got to classify a new chondrite. We took a unidentified meteorite had it classified, entered into the Meteoritical Bulletin, which is the great big book of everything with named meteorites. You guys can see that big polka dot right there. That is a chondrule. They are some of the oldest things that we know of in our universe that actually contains particles of dust all the way back until basically when our planets were forming, which is just really awesome. It's really cool. And this was given to me by my late professor, Larry Taylor, and he was just a really amazing man. And so I really treasure 
this piece of meteorite. I actually graduated college right when the oil market crashed. So I saw all of the entry level geology positions like out west and things like that just disappear overnight. My mom actually told me about JTV. So I literally, I sent an email and said, do you hire geologists? And I heard back really quickly. Within probably two weeks of getting in contact with JTV, I was hired. So, which was really crazy. It was just a whirlwind. I got really interested in gemology. I had no idea that all those really cool crystals and pretty rocks that I'd been seeing all through my geology education actually could be faceted. <laughs> through getting to handle all of them and see them, like, I really became interested in becoming a gemologist. I was given the opportunity to study to get my FGA through the Gemological Association of Great Britain. And it focuses a lot more on the science aspects, like how does this become this way? Like how do you get this and things like that. It took a lot of studying. What was the hardest thing to learn? I really struggled to think like with light. Light in gemstones is so much more important than light with geological specimens. So I was asked to show what was so hard to learn. And so I'm gonna show you guys like the quick and dirty about total internal reflection and critical angle. So with different types of gemstone materials, you actually have what's called the critical angle and you have to get that beautiful critical angle to actually create reflection within the stone that can then be interpreted as your fire, as your brilliance, so that was always like really hard for me to understand. I'm just gonna draw a really quick and dirty gemstone. Say here's, here's your eye. That's kind of a creepy eye, but okay. We're looking at our stone. Your light rays come in and then they bounce out. And then you actually have multiple ways that they bounce out. This is called total internal reflection. It doesn't look like it, because you would think that total internal reflection would actually be where it comes in, bounces, and then bounces straight back out. Well, if that actually happens, you have interference of your light, and it can actually make the stone look dark and not pretty. So the advice that I have for future gemologists and geologists as well, don't be afraid to try new things. Don't be afraid to contact people and just ask questions. And if you guys are really curious, we actually have kits that we've put together online. I helped put them together and chose, you know, the different species of stones. And if I wasn't working here and wanted to get into it, it's a great resource to have. Where did your interest in gems begin? Ah, a little trip down memory lane. This is a Illinois pocket watch. They were used in the railroad industry to make sure trains did not hit one another. I was given this as a Christmas present many, many, many years ago. I used to wear it every single day, and because I was wearing it every single day and I bumped into things, because I'm not the most graceful person, I had to have this glass replaced a couple of times I decided I needed to get a lesser expensive watch to carry on a daily basis. I spent a lot of time going to garage sales trying to find that nice but lesser expensive watch and I'd find a few things here and there. One of the most interesting things I found was this bowl. This is about a 15 ounce Paul Revere bowl. I had no idea what silver was worth but I noticed the word sterling on the bottom of it so I bought it because I knew that that had something to do with value took it to the watchmaker that I had had replaced my crystals there and they told me the silver content of the bowl alone was worth about 10 times what I had paid for the bowl itself. And so that led me to start looking for silver. I was at an antique store and I saw this little guy, just totally articulated little fish skeleton, almost jingles like a bell. And what was very interesting to me was the hallmarks. The hallmarks are basically little marks that tell about what the material is made of, uh, and more specifically, who made it. And there's a little crown that says Antonio on the top of the crown, and that's for Antonio Pineda, who is a master smith in Tasco, Mexico. Got it for $14 took it home, did some research on it, found an online antiques company that had had one of this exact same series of pen, and they had already sold theirs for $450. So that led me to know I needed to start looking for this Tasco jewelry, and that led me to collecting Tasco silver jewelry, and that is what really led me to jewelry television because I had a friend who was working here who said, hey, you buy jewelry for fun, why not come to JTV and get paid to do it? And when I walked into JTV, 
ATV to be a jewelry buyer, I noticed they had all these sparkly rocks in their jewelry and I had no idea what any of those were. And so I was suggested you should probably, you know, if you're really interested in this, go get some gemological knowledge and they suggested GIA and I signed up immediately that week. The GG, which is the graduate gemologist degree that I got from GIA, was super handy to have, but I wanted to add even more knowledge, so I wanted to get the diploma from the Gemological Association of Great Britain, which I did, and that makes me also a fellow of the Gemological Association of Great Britain, or FGA. Okay, and that's what this little pin is right here. That addition to my knowledge has helped me immensely throughout uh, well, all these videos specifically. <laughs> so one of the neatest things that I learned was visual optics by Alan Hodgkinson. This is a method of kind of eliminating possibilities to identify a gemstone that doesn't require using any tools except for your eye. And what you do is you take a gemstone, you have the table of the gemstone, which is the flat part. You hold that up to your eye and you literally just look through the gemstone at a distant point of light. And because the peridot that I'm holding up splits light into two different light beams as light comes through it, I can see that the lights of the uh, studio here are doubled. And so I know absolutely that this isn't glass. One of the coolest, coolest little methods you can ever learn. Advice I would have for anyone who wants to be a gemologist, look at as many gemstones as you can. Whatever gemstones you can get, even if it's like you know, just little mixed parcels that you find, those are absolutely wonderful. I cut my teeth gemologically on going through mixed faceted parcels, picking things out because you're gonna have like anywhere from you know, 10, 20, 30 different kinds of gemstones in there. Great experience. And of course, while you're looking at all of these gemstones, you're going to need a good book. I recommend the Systemology Reference that will have all the properties that you need to know to be able to identify these gemstones. A book like this will have not only properties that require tools to aid in identification, but even things just like your basic color, clarity, dispersion, things like that you can see with the naked eye so you can get started just as soon as you have a gem in a book. I highly recommend it. I want you to take a closer look at this one. This is the one that really sent me on my way towards being a gemologist. It's one of my favorite little guys, a little wiggler. <laughs> I'd like you guys to take a closer look at my meteorite piece. I just think it's awesome. All those flecks of space metal. Okay, so I want you to take a closer look at this piece of jewelry right here. I believe that's a chrysoprase and it's just a spectacularly designed piece and it's pieces like these that I hope to own one day. Hope you all enjoyed today's episode. I think it was beneficial to see three gemologists and their unique paths to get to where they are today. Like, subscribe, ring that bell. If you've got any questions, we'd like to see them in the comments. It's your questions that allow us to do really awesome episodes like this. So thank you so much. We will catch you next week.